Uh, first of all, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my fourth or fifth time that I'm participating in the President's Conference. And I must admit that every time it's a, it's a pleasure, a new pleasure, and meeting new people, hearing new ideas, and getting to share concepts um, with the general society, the people who actually support the research that we do. And what I'd like to talk about is the concept of uh, prevention. So when I first started medical school, believe it or not, 50 years ago, in New York, the dean of the medical school, uh, Dr. Saul, Saul Farber, got up to give the introductory uh, remarks. He greeted all the students, and he, said, he made a statement that until today resonates in my mind. He said, you all think you came here to cure diseases. He said, that's not true. The role of the physician is to prevent disease. 50 years ago, we knew this, but it was harder to prevent disease. Today, it's much more obvious that this is the case, but we're still very far from being able to do this because this is a very, very difficult task. And prevent, to prevent diseases, preventative medicine requires a different level of understanding, a different level of research. And I'd like to give you a simple example. I know uh, Leroy Hood started off with an example of a radio. I thought you were gonna steal my thunder, but fortunately, my example is from a car. So, <laughs> and we're, we're all basically amateur scientists. And when you are in the car and something goes wrong, all of a sudden steam starts coming out of the car, your first reaction is, to open up the hood and see what's wrong. This is, this, is this is science. What went wrong? And you look inside and you see that the hose burst, okay? So your first reaction as an amateur scientist is to fix it. Now, how do you fix it? It's very easy. You take some glue or you take some bubble gum or take something else, a Band-Aid, and you fix the hose and you basically solve the problem. Well, you haven't really solved the problem, but you've solved your immediate problem, okay? Now, if you are a little bit more than an amateur scientist, you'll say to yourself, but why did this happen? And you'll start looking into this hose, and very quickly you'll come to the conclusion that this hose is made out of a material that can burst. And so you'll start thinking about, perhaps, wouldn't it be better if we made this hose with a different kind of material that, was, that would hold better? Or you might say, and you'd be right in doing this, if you were a really good scientist, you'd say, well, the hose is probably okay, but there's something inside the car, deep down inside the motor of the car, or the workings of the car, that went wrong. All of a sudden, there's been this increased pressure that made the, the tube, that made this rubber tube burst. There's something deep down inside, something a lot more basic that might be wrong with the car. And if you were even a, 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 a more curious scientist, right, you would even say, well, you know, maybe the way this whole car is designed is not right. Maybe there's a better way to design this car so that this kind of increased pressure will not happen and then the hose won't burst, okay? So these, this is the process of scientific inquiry, okay? And the farther you go down in that hierarchy, the farther you get down to understanding the basic workings of this machine, okay, you are now in a better position for preventing what happened to this car. And it's the same way with human beings and disease. Doctors observe patients. They see there's something wrong. The first response is the simple scientific response. How can I make the symptom go away? 
Okay? But the thoughtful doctor or the thoughtful researcher will understand that this happened because of something much deeper. And this will lead him into trying to understand the cells that are involved, the biochemistry that's involved, the physiology that's involved in this, and the genes that are involved with this. In man, the situation is much more complicated because in the car, man built the car. He designed it. He knows what it looks like. He knows how it's put together. Right? We don't know that. We have to study that ourselves. We don't know how this machine is put together. So first you have to understand what are the components? How is this machine made? How is it put together? What are the circuits? How do they connect with one another? How does this part affect this part and this part affect this part? All those things are unknown. It requires a great amount of research. And, more, and, the, and in order to really understand how it works and in order to try and be able to change things, you have to do the kind of basic research where you can get in and manipulate things and see what that does. Okay? And so the concept here is that if we want to reach a higher level of medicine, if we want to reach a level of medicine where we're capable of not only treating diseases, okay, not only fixing the problem, but it actually preventing and, and, and Leroy uh, suggested this kind, already hinted at this thing. We said that the emphasis today is beginning to be on wellness. That's the idea. If you can develop, if you can understand the system well enough so that you can catch it before it happens. In other words, you've decoded the algorithm. You understand what's happened. Maybe now you can catch it and develop a way to prevent it from happening. And I'd like to give you just a very short example from the type of work that we do that maybe will uh, help us uh, sort of crystallize this idea, okay? So you all know that there are a lot of treatments for cancer, there are a lot of ways of going about it. The last 15, 20 years have been amazing in the sense that scientists and doctors have come up with wonderful new drugs that are able actually able to target certain cells and to target certain processes in those cells and make these treatments a lot more specific and a lot more effective. But I point out to you that every one of these treatments is based on being able to identify in each particular tumor what's wrong or what distinguishes it from the rest of the body. All of these cures are based on that. And it turns out that in almost every case, if you find a cure, like for CML, you found a cure for CML, but doesn't help you with the 99 or 199 other types of cancer that exist. Okay? So we started working on something over 35 years ago uh, not because we were interested in treating cancer, it never dawned on us, but because we were curious. And we discovered a very interesting process. You all know that our bodies are made up of components. As scientists, we call those components proteins. Those proteins are present in all of our cells. Right? And these are the components, these are the, like the pieces of a car of the human body. In order for the body to be able to make these components, it has a book of information, which we call our genetic, our genome, our genetic information. And each one of these proteins has a little place in this book where it says how to make this protein. It's, it's really a, a, a little booklet that explains how to make all the components of the body. And about 35 years ago, we discovered that this book, just like many books, many texts, many languages, can also be annotated. So just like if I would give you a text to read in English or a text to read in Hebrew, and you had to read it before somebody, you would first go over the text and cross this out and mark this and say, put emphasis over here, erase this, shorten the sentence here. You would annotate it. What does the annotation do? It tells you how to read it. And in the body as well, there's an annotation system. It's called DNA methylation which 
puts markings on this book and tells the book what should be read, what should be read in this cell, what should be read in another cell, what should be read at this time in development, what should be read when the, when the, when the, the cell is sick. Right? This is an annotation system. And from this, we learned a lot about development. Right? But it turns out, it turns out that in cancer, this annotation system is, is disrupted. And one of the reasons why cancer cells behave the way they do is not because their genes are also a little different, but a lot of it has to do with the change in annotation. And what's amazing about this process is that it's not specific for any cancer. It's a general process. And we know that this process of methylation, this process of annotation, is necessary for the tumor to form. So here, basic research, and it's really basic research because the intention of doing it had nothing to do with disease, right? Perhaps may provide a new way of looking at this disease, which will allow us to get to the bottom of the disease perhaps to be able to find a common approach, and even looking farther down the line, maybe even to find ways of slowing down or protecting the appearance of this disease. Thank you very much. Thank you.